All right, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I know it's 5 o'clock. It's the last session of the day. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, we're here to talk about citizen development and unleashing citizen developers effectively. Um, my name's Karen Fidelic. I am a product manager in our Salesforce DX um, group. I work out of our Colorado, Louisville, Colorado office. Um, I'm responsible for parts of our ALM um, process, specifically around our metadata APIs and our tooling APIs and metadata support in general throughout our platform. I'm here with Paul. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Hi, my name is Paul Dobra. I'm an associate functional consultant um, in London, actually. And I've been with the company for just about two years. I joined as part of the graduate program. And in case you've uh, not noticed, Max is not from around here. I'm actually Romanian, born and raised. Excellent. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, before we get started, I just have to remind you all, um, if we're talking about anything forward looking here, please make your purchasing decisions based on software and product that is currently generally available. So citizen development. Let me start by um, getting a show of hands. How many of you, are any of you out here would consider yourselves a citizen developer? Yeah? How about, do we have IT folks in the audience here? Yeah. Um, do we have people who aren't sure because we're not even sure what I mean when I'm talking about citizen development? And that's why we're here? Yeah. So there's a lot of questions that maybe we're looking to have answered here. How do we determine, what is a citizen developer? We're going to talk about that. How do we determine who would be um, a good fit for getting involved in doing citizen development? How does that citizen development model work with IT? How do we work with IT as opposed to working around them? How do we determine what are good types of applications to build with a citizen development model? We're going to go through um, a set of slides here over the next 20 minutes. Um, and to give you just a taste, um, we've got not that much time. We're going to try to give you a taste of what citizen development model looks like and how you can do this in a responsible way, putting a governance model around it. So we're going to start with defining a citizen developer. I'm going to hand it over to Paul. Thank you. So let's just define what a uh, citizen developer actually is. Well, a citizen developer is someone in the line of business or in operations who builds, uh, creates a Salesforce application out with the IT department, but under the close guidance and supervision of the IT department. Well, this definition is based on external research that's been published by Salesforce, and uh, also on an internal study that I helped co-author within the customer success group department. Why did we do this in the first place? That's because of a phenomenon called the developer gap. Well, for you guys who are actually sitting here, you may have heard of it. Um, it's probably a good thing if you really want to start in the Salesforce industry right now. Uh, but there is a really wide uh, um, gap between the supply and demand of technical resources, right? So what that means is, for example, an IT backlog that is ever increasing because IT cannot s satisfy everything that's happening out there, or a phenomenon which is called shadow IT. Shadow IT is when the business unit decides to start their own and do their own thing, um, independent of IT, do their own thing, uh, using for tools such as Access or Excel. And the moment in which any of those tools actually fail, they have really big negative consequences, such as loss of data and um, irrecuperable like, damages. So I myself, I'm not a computer scientist, but I do work in the Salesforce ecosystem. So how do we actually do this? Well, enter Salesforce. Salesforce is a platform that allows um, both people who cannot code or don't want to code and people with a more technical background to develop amazing applications right, and do a, a really good return on investment for the company. Um, that's exactly why we're here. I'm going to be t telling you a little bit about best practices, uh, whereas um, Karen will be taking you through uh, some of the governance and release management um, aspects of citizen developer. Uh, we'll also talk about, uh, you know, we'll leave you with some resources towards the end. So let's just stop, start off with talking about best practices. The very first thing that Salesforce would recommend is configure, not code. You may have heard, heard of this mantra, click, not code. So it's exactly what CSG or the customer success group uh, here at Salesforce recommends. Uh, and I will be diving deeper into uh, this particular uh, principle just in a couple of moments. Another thing that we recommend is strong naming conventions that allows people to differentiate between what's been built by a citizen developer and what's been built by the IT developers. 
right? Mentioning common business components. That's what IT would help build in order to have a transition between what's happening on the citizen developer projects, right? So if there's any commonality or something that's happening on that side, right? Configuring our code? Well, what is that? I mentioned about, uh, I, I talked about what the Celsius platform can do. And what we recommend is that the business users on this side, who are the citizen, you know, prom candidates to become citizen developers, would utilize the declarative aspect of Salesforce. That means things such as process builder, approval processes, escalation rules, something, you know, just talking about the visual aspects of it, the declarative. Whereas the other side, developers, would be using tools such as Apex, Lightning Components, or Visual Force. We talked about how. Let's talk about what citizen developers are actually supposed to be doing. So in terms of roles and responsibilities, citizen developers are the ones who would propose the actual application. And then based on triage um, you know, by the IT department, they'll be the ones who create the application. So proposing, creating the application, testing it, supporting it, and also consuming what they've actually built, right? On the other side are the IT developers. So we have to distinguish between the two categories of developers, right? The IT developers are the ones who sit in the IT department. And they are the ones who review, the, uh, review what's happening. They have uh, overall ownership of the, the whole citizen developer program. And you know, as I mentioned, they provide uh, support and build common business components. Let's also talk about another framework, uh, so just a couple of aspects uh, you know, to build a successful fra framework for uh, this citizen developer program. You have to identify suitable candidates, people who are, such as myself, with a degree uh, in a STEM discipline could be potential candidates to you know, build applications. Um, but we do talk about um, identif of, you know, creating a close partnership between IT and the line managers, because this may be on top of what uh, the business analysts are actually supposed to be doing. So you know, it's all about that workload, that additional workload. So you know, you have to have a really good uh, understanding of what uh, they're actually supposed to be doing. Mentioning about um, what's in this for me is also critical. Why would you ever become a citizen developer in the first place? Why would I want to start building stuff on Salesforce? Well, because I will be trained, right, to do this. So enablement, extremely important. We have Trailhead or formal training in terms of like, you know, the former Salesforce Trail, um, the Training Academy uh, with courses such as ADX 201 or DEX 402. Um, you know, they are there to support uh, building a very successful framework on, on the citizen developer uh, platform. And um, I mentioned technical support. So IT should be the ones who would buddy up or help the citizen developer um, obviously, you know, create uh, this new functionality and be there when there are obstacles that need to be succumbed. Um, I'm going to, you know, I only briefly touched on governance, but I'll just uh, hand it to Karen right now to talk about release management that will cover the entire application lifecycle. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's get into some more governance principles around, specifically around release management. Um, so Probably one of the reasons why you're interested or you're going to get interested in leveraging the power of citizen development as a model um, is to increase your productivity um, and get more applications being built quickly um, because of those additional resources that you can take advantage of. Um, with that, though, you want to make sure that we're doing that in a controlled and responsible way and that we have some governance around this process, specifically around the release management process. Um, ALM, or Application Lifecycle Management, has basically these, these phases um, when we talk about release management. You're going to have a development phase. You're going to have probably a couple of test phases. Um, and you're finally going to have a release to production step. To put a good governance process around this, um, we need people. We need good tools and technology. And we need a strong process to make to support this in a, in a strong way. The people that we're going to be talking about here specifically um, are the citizen developer and the IT resources. And what we're going to do is go through um, some different release management processes and flows and talk about how does IT and citizen developers work together to produce the most efficient 
productive environment where we can get applications built, but in a controlled and still agile way. Okay. At Salesforce, we talk about two models of development when we talk about ALM. Um, we talk about a change set development model and a package development model. Change set development is basically where you're working in sandboxes doing development and you're moving changes, sets of changes, which we call change sets, um, between your various uh, development and test and production environments. Package development is where you've got externalized and modularized source, um, which is installed as packages into your various development environments. We've got a line between these two here, um, but really, it is not a strong line. It is not really a one or the other in the case of choosing one of these development models. You can, you can do a little bit of both depending on kind of where you are in your adoption, where you are in, in the stages of your, your org's life cycle, um, your application's life cycle. So it's really not either or. Um, what we're gonna be talking about is in the context of each one of these though, how do we leverage both types of people that we we're talking about, citizen devs, and IT in an effective way. So we're going to start by talking about change set development. This is our traditional change set development model um, where you're doing development in a sandbox um, and you're creating change sets through our setup UI and moving that change set again through the UI, through the various test environments and into production. And then when we talk about how do we incorporate both citizen developers and IT in a model like this, the citizen developer is doing the development in those sandboxes. Single citizen developer working in a single sandbox, doing development. When they're done, they're going to create an outbound change set through the UI, put the changes that they've made into that change set, um, and then IT is going to kind of pick up and move that change set through a test environment, maybe through UAT, do the validation, move it through the various stages all the way through to production. Um, the second sort of variation on this change set development, again, this is still change set development, but now we're talking about programmatic change sets. So in this case, rather than making the change set through the UI, we're going to be leveraging our command line interface to create these bundles or these programmatic change sets of metadata that are going to be pulled out of the org, and still the case of a sandbox here, um, and then deployed into the subsequent environments in our pipeline. So in this case, when we're talking about citizen developers and IT, the line is drawn in a similar way the citizen developer is still doing development in that sandbox, but now, because we're talking about a programmatic interface, um, and we remember that we wanna keep our citizen devs um, more in a, in a UI declarative kind of mode of operation, and the IT resource working more in a programmatic mode of operation, um, we're gonna have the citizen dev doing their development in the sandbox, but then we're gonna have the IT resources pulling those changes out of the sandbox using our source commands, source retrieve, and then using those same commands to deploy into the downstream environments here. Um, sort of the, the catch here is that IT needs to know what changes to pull. So there's gotta be some communication there with the, with the citizen dev. Um, we are going to be starting to introduce source tracking in sandboxes very shortly, which is going to facilitate sort of the programmatic ability to pull changes out of that sandbox and then bundle those up and move them through a deploy operation into the downstream environments. The final development model here is our package-based development. So in this case, we've got source that's externalized and it's, it's bundled up Basically, like you can think of each application becoming a package. Um, development is done in scratch orgs. Scratch orgs are basically temporary, empty orgs that can be configured however you want. So they can live up to 30 days. They're created empty. You can configure the shape of them, and you can load them with whatever metadata 
you want. So the idea here is you have your source externalized. Maybe it's stored in a source repository. You load that into your Scratch org. You do your development. And then you create a package that gets installed into our downstream environments. Now, in this case with Citizen Developer, we're going to have the IT person actually create that Scratch org for the Citizen Developer to work in. Because again, those Scratch orgs get created through our CLI interface. So again, it's a programmatic kind of interface today. Um, and so if we want to take advantage of this in this kind of model, the IT person would be creating that environment, that Scratch org. Um, and the citizen developer could do their development in there just like they would in a sandbox. Really would look no different. Um, then when they're done, the IT resource can pull those changes out using our source push and pull commands to extract just the changes that have been made easily. Um, could create a package and then use that package to install it into downstream environments. This could also be leveraged to take advantage of automated continuous integration, continuous deployment processes. And like I said, also um, keeping that source externalized and in a source control repository. So this is a little bit, little bit more advanced down the line. But you can see that there is still a way to involve a citizen dev and an IT resource in this case. One thing to be aware of, I mentioned it, but Scratch orgs are only, um, can only be living for up to 30 days. So given that, there has to be tight communication between the IT resource and the citizen dev to make sure that that, sand or that scratch org is being refreshed appropriately so that it doesn't just go poof on the citizen developer when they're not quite done with their development yet. Okay. So to recap, um, you know, we, we went through a lot of this really quickly. We're going to provide you with some resources um, where you can get more insights and best practices and really read about customers and organizations that have been able to adopt this kind of development model really successfully. So whether or not we've answered these questions for you, convinced you that this is a model that you want to embark on, I know that we have customers who have been very successful in taking advantage of a model like this, where they can embrace citizen developers within their organization to truly increase productivity um, while still maintaining a controlled and governed process. They've created training programs and certification models to train their citizen devs. They've created committees for approving and reviewing applications that citizen devs want to build and working with them on the sort of design and review of those. Um, they've learned to work with IT as opposed to around IT um, to make sure that this is a well-governed process and that the life cycle of that application is, is well understood by the overall organization. So with that, if we look at the resources that we have available, um, these are all really interesting resources that we have that kind of go beyond our typical documentation and, and, and trailhead modules. We'll get to those. But this first one here is a white paper that's specifically around empowering and embracing citizen development. Um, the second one, this is a podcast series that we have, um, which is done by IT leaders in the industry. So from the IT perspective, um, we can look at some of the best practices and things that IT leaders are doing um, within their organizations. Um, and then the final one here is a, is, a new, is a new website that we're working on building right now that's going to have a lot of resources around citizen development. So it's citizendevelopment.salesforce.com. You can go on there today and subscribe, and you'll be notified as new content is added. Um, but here's where you'll be able to get things like best practices and case studies, customers who have been able to take advantage of these kinds of models successfully. So really highly encourage you to go take a look at these. Uh, trailhead course. Um, we've got several modules that we're, re we're recommending here, both kind of from the side of the citizen dev, so the development side when we talk about application building. Um, also on more of the, I think we've got some more of the ALM. I don't know if we have those in here, but um, more of the IT side and the ALM side. So kind of both sides of the spectrum um, are worth making sure that we've got um, visibility into. Um, what's next? Uh, so this is a list of some of the sessions that we've got tomorrow that we just picked out 
um, from the schedule that, that may have interest to you given these, these, these topics. So again, this is going to also hit on some of the app dev, um, sort of no code sessions for that citizen dev, um, and also some of sort of the IT and governance sessions that might hit more of the IT kind of user. Um, tomorrow morning at 11 um, is a super session built together with low code. Highly encourage everybody to get to these super sessions. They're quite engaging and interesting. Um, and then if you haven't found it yet, downstairs we've got the booths um, where we've got developers and product managers that you can speak to directly and ask questions. So take advantage of that. Cool. With that, um, again, I'd like to thank you all. I know it's late. <laughs> Paul and I will be around um, here to answer questions if you have anything uh, that hasn't been answered yet. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>